Brownian motion is the random movement of particles suspended in a fluid. Have you ever seen light shining on water droplets suspended in air? Brownian motion is the reason those water droplets are there. The air molecules are randomly colliding with the water droplets, keeping them off the ground. If you are a small particle, you are going to travel a lot by these collisions. But what about if you are a big molecule? Well, you won't travel as far. These random collisions are grouped together in a process called diffusion. This is the process of how particles move spontaneously through any medium through thermodynamic entropy. A special type of graph describes this motion perfectly. This is referred to as the Gaussian distribution. The x-axis is the distance from the starting point, and the y-axis is the probability of finding the particle at this distance. The key feature that a Gaussian has is that the most probable place to find a particle from its starting position is its starting position. Because diffusion is based on movement and collisions, it is very dependent on the fluid the particle is in. Honey is much thicker than water. Because of this, the particle in the honey will move much less compared to the particle in the water. This is because the particle in the water doesn't encounter as much resistance as the particle in the honey does. This distribution is tighter with the particles in the honey than in the water. These particles are more likely to be found closer to their starting point than in the water. This is because the particles in the honey encounter much more resistance when moving around than the particles in the water, and so they can't diffuse away as easily. Understanding a Gaussian is fundamental to understanding transport phenomena in biological systems. It tells you how particles will move, where they will go, and how they will interact under such settings. However, there is no one-size-fits-all Gaussian. So then, how do we tell what the Gaussian will look like for a particle? That job falls to a computational analysis known as mean squared displacement. This analysis provides three main conclusions. One, how much will the particle have traveled in a given unit of time, two, what situation is the particle in, and we'll revisit this later, and three, what is the diffusivity constant of a particle. To do this analysis, only one data set is needed, the position of the particle with respect to time, which is to say the particle's trajectory. Now that we have this data, we can apply the mean square displacement formula. The main gist of the formula is to take the difference between two positions along the trajectory that is separated by a time amount known as the tau value. You then square this difference and move on to the next point, adding up all the squares as you go. So I know this may be a bit confusing, so let's walk through a data set now. So let's say we're using a tau value of 1. This means that we're going to take points that are separated by 1 second and keep going until we go through all the points. Let's start here with these two points. We take the difference, square it, and then we're going to move on to the next two points, and the next two, until we're done with the whole data set. And this will be the MSD for a tau value of 1. Now we increment the tau value again. So this time we're going to use a tau value of 2. So we're taking the points that are separated by 2 seconds. So here we're going to take the first pair, See how we're skipping one here, and then continuing this until we get the full data set. So now we've done the tau value of 2. Now that we have our MSD values for corresponding tau values, we can start to get useful information. Now to determine our goal number 1, which was to determine how much the particle will have traveled in a unit amount of time, we will get the MSD for tau of 1. That will basically tell us how much the particle will have moved in a given tau amount of time. To determine number 2, which is what situation the particle is in, we need to graph the MSD values versus the tau values. From this graph, we would expect to see three outcomes. The first one would be that the line is completely straight. This indicates that there is only pure diffusion happening or the line could curve up. This represents drift of some sort, whether it's a fluid flow, electromagnetic drag, pressure, any of those things. And from that, you could actually calculate how strong that force is. The third option is that the line will plateau. This represents that the particle is confined. To determine the size of that confinement, simply take the square root of the plateau value, and that'll be how constrained the particle is in that dimension. So we match our data to one of these three main trends to get an idea of what situation our particle is in.
Now we need to determine number three, which was the diffusivity constant. We have a handy equation to help us figure this out. The capital D is the constant we are looking for. The lowercase d is the dimension of freedom we are looking at. For our case, the d is going to be a value of one for one direction, and it can be a maximum of three for x, y, and z. Tau is the time value we are using for the MSD. So now that we have the diffusivity constant, we can get a Gaussian. The width at the Gaussian at half of its peak value will be equal to this equation, where t is the time that we are looking at the particle since the start. This makes sense. The larger the diffusivity constant, the more the particle can travel in a set amount of time, and so the Gaussian should be larger to represent this. From this one experiment, we know how far the particle can move in a given time, what sort of condition the particle is under, and a quantitative measurement of the particle's dynamics in a diffusive state. To put this in perspective, we'd be able to tell how long it takes a neurotransmitter to cross the synaptic cleft, we can develop microfluidic platforms for separation of particles, and we can estimate the apparent size of a particle.